Kia ora, uh, my name is Chris Tees. Um, thank you, Featherston, for having me here. Um, I'm going to read a couple of poems from my most recent collection, Supermodel Minority. Uh, to begin with, this is called Version Control. It has come to my attention that we have fucked things up. Not that we inherited the best bones to work with. Some broken a few too many times, others carelessly tossed into suitcases that no one will ever claim. The bones don't always form a whole. It's 1616 and they're publicly burning us to ashes for sodomy. It's 1885 and they've made us criminals to protect decency. It's 1998 and they're beating us, torturing us, and tying us to fences. It's 2023, and they're rediscovering old ways to erase us. Each time we say it gets better or that we will learn from the past, we set ourselves up for crushing failure, jinxed and cursed, a self-addressed envelope for a future that will never come to pass. This time is no different from all the other times. In one version, we were golden, our nights sweetly perfumed by the sea breezes of childhood holidays and apple crumble just out of the oven. We failed to mention that one year, a young boy's body washed ashore in non-accidental circumstances, and later, bad wiring in the oven was the cause of our house burning down. In another version, our days are drowned in blue screen light, electrifying our brains and keeping us up at night so that we stew in the unmistakable stench of bodies rotting under the floorboards. We buried our dead, but we didn't bury the causes of their deaths, and therein lies the seed of our predicament. All these versions of the past are the same explosion replayed at different speeds, and our failure to act is the debris blacking out the sun. We can't bury the lines between then now and now then, hoping no one will notice they're missing and go looking for them to prove we haven't changed at all. We can't be that fucking naive. Tell me which version of the world you want to live in. The one in which the definition of a body is a loaded gun waiting to be shot or the one in which the definition of hope is a meteorite passing over our heads and disappearing into the uncharted skies. Both are valid, but only one will let you sleep at night. Thank you. Um, this next one is uh, called Identikit. When asked to explain the lines that lead to now, you describe the shape of your body as it hits water. The shape of cold water shocking muscle. The shape of fleshy chambers forced to loosen and acquiesce. The shape of your grandparents in their coffins. The shape of coffins that are too small to contain entire lifetimes. The soft and hard moments we can't forget, no matter how often we turn our backs to the light. You write this poem out of love, but even love can be a blindfold. The shape of you and your parents standing in your grandparents' driveway after being kicked out for talking to your auntie's white boyfriend. Your hand reaching out to someone you don't recognize in a dream, their silhouette branded upon your brain. You've tried to swallow the night and all its inhabitants, but they weren't designed for consumption. The night standing in for doubt as you argue with your own memory. Waking up to the smell of pee dan sol yok jok. The shape of a bowl designed to hold love. Love that is never spoken of because to do so would silence it. The shape of silence when you tell your parents you've fallen in love with a white boy. The shape of that white boy pressed against your body. Both your hearts shaped like hungry mouths. The shape of your mouth biting into the world's biggest egg. The shape of years spent running before walking, your knees shredded and bloody, even after you grew the thick skin they said you would need in this lifetime. The years pass like a watched pot, but you imagine steam rising from its wide open body, flashbacks to the shape of air being forced into a lifeless body. 
Some incisions are made to clean blood, others to fast forward a certain end. When your grandparents spoke of life, it was whatever came their way. No one back then had time to hide behind the sky, to pull strings, to taste control. The shape of control does not fit with the shape of effort. A grounded bird tries to climb an invisible ladder to heaven to correct a path the world wouldn't let it look upon in case it traced a line too close to comfort. We all fear the shape of comfort when it belongs to someone else, forgetting that we all look the same buried six feet under. Both your grandparents appear before you on the night you learn how to take off your blindfold when you finally recognize the shape of acceptance and how it might fit among the ruins of your rejections. It goes like this. The fights, the kisses, the direct hits. Unfolding yourself into a shape the world doesn't know how to contain. What doesn't fit, what doesn't hold true. The shape of your name. The shape of a bowl that never empties. All of these things fit together if you turn them the right way up. You run your finger along the lip of the bowl and remember what it means to be laced in time and not know how to use your hands to feed yourself. You count the years. You feel their shape flooding your throat, making a noise, making a space for what's to come. Thank you. Um, earlier this, uh, this afternoon, I did a session um, with graduates from the Fertorea um, publishing course, um, and we talked about editing and publishing. Um, I've actually written a poem for a book that's coming out later this year to commemorate, I think it's the 20th anniversary, 30th anniversary. Um, so I'm going to read that poem, and this is the first time I've read this out. Um, when I was asked to write this poem, I was also working on a whole lot of other poems at the same time, and they were sort of dealing with some serious subject matter. And then, so this poem kind of ended up being like my weird outlet. So this is called, How to Edit a Poem. Do not follow it. <laughs> How to Edit a Poem. Let the poem approach you first. Don't point, don't scare it. Encircle the poem with broken lines and half-hearted rhymes to reverse any spell that may cause the reader sorrow. Ask yourself, is the poem merely camouflage for the poet's desires? All persons, real or imagined, are questions and aphorisms double-crossing each other in pursuit of a revelation. Inside this poem there are two poets. One is literal and the other is metaphorical. Ask yourself, is the poet a secret carried in a whale's mouth? Capitalize every word that reminds you of your childhood. Strike out every verb that will make the reader feel guilty for not living a wholesome and virtuous life. Inside this poem, there are two poets. One tells the truth, and the other got away with it. Ask yourself, when did you last trust a poem? Interrogate each line as if it were a coordinate plucked from a map. A crooked staircase halfway to the moon. A wolf cries in the dark. The margins seesaw as you pull yourself into the poem for a better view, to take it all in. There is no way out. Use the poem as a mirror. Use the mirror as a sucker punch. Attack the mirror with a mallet. Hide the broken shards and the feathers of birds and instruct them to land on rooftops when the night is at its softest. The townsfolk's sleep is disturbed by the crackle of crystal rain. Record their reactions. Respond, respond, respond. Thank you. This next poem so, uh, is called Cantonese. Um, late last year, uh, there was a little bit of backlash around Chinese Language Week. Uh, and my first poem as Poet Laureate was about that whole thing. <laughs> um, I actually ended up writing two poems um, about Cantonese, um, and this one I didn't publish um, because I was like, oh, it's too sad, um, and I wanted to be like fiery instead. Um, but this poem is um, going to be appearing in an anthology um, 
uh, from writers with a connection to Hong Kong, um, which is coming out later this month. So this is called Cantonese. The list of topics in which I can have conversations with my dad in Cantonese shrinks with each passing year. I can ask him how to steam egg to the perfect silky consistency. I can tell him I'm too busy to visit because I have a poem to write. He can share his regrets with me, but I can't offer comfort back to him in his first tongue. I can only nod to show that I understand. The limits of your language define the limits of your world. In the world I share with my dad, we're both on the sidelines expecting each other to leap onto the court with effortless words to play a syncopated game. Instead, we fault ourselves in two languages, and I hear the hesitation in his voice when he switches to English because we've reached an impasse. In these moments, my biggest regret is not having done enough to speak to his heart. Even this poem won't make a difference. Even this poem is a wall. Thank you. Um, I've just got two uh, more short poems. Um, this one was meant to be in Supermodel Minority, um, but it got cut at the very, very last minute. Sometimes you, th you think a, a poem is just going to you know, be one of those important central poems, um, but sometimes they decide, actually, no, not, not my time. Um, and this poem is um, about that feeling that you get every time you see a headline in the news about another mass shooting. Um, and this week alone, I have just started to feel like I can't even keep track of whatever shooting people are talking about. Uh, so this is good now. Now is news. Now is a current affairs show sponsored by a sugar-free drink. Now is all the shades of blood we've gleaned from police procedurals and body cams. Now we know how to react to another lifeless body shared on social media. Now is a call out in the middle of the night that the media will sensationalize, that an ambiguous noun cannot comprehensively address because they choose their words based on the perpetrator's skin color or the heartstrings dangling from the victim's backstory. Now we wonder if this is where our children's futures play out, drowning in the fuzzy hum of television sets stuck on tragedy. Now, when you were the blunt force trauma they brought to an election after party, now, when the world was a set of scales no one trusted, tipping between the inertia of another moment of silence and now is not the time for politics. Now is a schoolyard. Now is a massage parlor in a mosque. Now is a cafeteria serving today's special. Now is the swampy heat of a basement club. Now is a safe space. Now is rendered void. Now is never here when you need it. Now is forever lost faster than a weapon thrust into breath, bigger than a front page headline in red, more invisible than a queer body or a colored body hiding in plain sight, but foolishly thinking that your skin peeled back is of no alarm, because now the real world is out there trapping its young, and we are so easy to convince that now will one day come. So I will read um, something that is not a love poem, but it is, I think, um, a little bit hopeful. This is called um, Wolf Spirit Fade Out, and it's from um, my, my, uh, my previous book, He So Mask. Wolf Spirit Fade Out. There's a song you cannot trust to keep you bathed in colour. It pounds like a 90s house piano track until your legs turn to smoke. It fades into shadow. It stops smiling when you enter a room. The last light falls from your face as the moon carves its way out of the sky. This song is the death of the wolf, is the death of days you thought you were both still singing, passing into wild youth, diminishing from earshot. Just be happy for having danced with the wolf, his clear, solitaire eyes, his tracks in your history. Be brave. Press repeat. Thank you very much.